meetings and that those, those meetings, how do, those work for us in practice or how they, they have been applied in different projects and how we are refining the, the, the rules and the, the, the approach by making more and more projects. So uh, I would invite you to look at the, uh, the previous sessions that we have. Also during the session and during, during, the, the, during the discussion, um, yeah, I think yeah, you have the, uh, the uh, Google Doc with some, uh, with some, uh, with some, with the links to those sessions. Um, and if you want to have to ask any questions, there will be a, a time for questions, but please put them on the chat, uh, for example, and then we will, we will get back to this. Without uh, more information, just I will just hand over to um, to Daniel to um, to drive the discussion. Fantastic! Thank you, uh, Jose, and, and uh, to everyone else for for joining and for the opportunity to share some of our experiences. Uh, we're I'm, I'm going to just run through. Uh, kind of uh, as, as GMB, some of what we've been doing with FIRE and our uh, sort of practical experiences with FIRE, um, particularly uh, in, in the past year, um, with a, a focus on, on one particular project and, and some of the, the, the tools and, and concepts that we applied to that. Uh, so there was uh, an introduction to, to GMB at, at the, the start, but um, basically the, one of the, the expertises that we have um, at, at GMB is in uh, health information exchange and the implementation of interoperability standards and profiles. We've been making use of FHIR for a number of years, but I think uh, more recently in, in the past year or two um, have sort of formalized a, a process and a way of, of how we um, actually use FHIR um, and, and how we contribute to things like implementation guides, um, participating in, in working groups, etc. Um, so what I'm going to focus on today is, is just some of our experiences in, in the um, uh, OpenHIM COVID-19 project, where we uh, did a, a lot to sort of formalize our process, which we've reused um, in, in other projects um, in terms of the, the, the use and application of FHIR. So the uh, COVID-19, the OpenHIM COVID-19 Data Exchange project was uh, formed as, as part of the, the work of the OpenHIE COVID-19 task force that was put together in uh, early 2020. Uh, and the objective of that uh, task force was to, to look at interoperability and data sharing needs of the global community um, specific to COVID-19. So this particular project that we worked on uh, focused on the development of a COVID-19 fire implementation guide, as well as the use of the OpenHIM as a, an interoperability layer um, developing a set of uh, mediators and services to support ingestion of COVID-19 case reporting and lab data uh, and persisting that to a central happy fire server as well as to DHS2. In using fire in this project what we wanted to do was enable support for simple ingestion formats um, easing the burden on, on existing systems um, that may already be in use and then also ensuring that a generic solution is, is developed that could be adaptable based on country needs. So this is just a, a diagram of the, 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 the use case that we, we focused on. Again, we were using the, the open HIM and a lot of the development went into um, development of a, a set of mediator services um, that was able to ingest that data and then persist it to uh, Happy Fire as well as to DHS2. Uh, the source data we expected it to come from a number of systems like your electronic medical records and case reporting systems, as well as lab information systems um, sending through lab results. So as I mentioned in, in the earlier slide, what we wanted to do was, was sort of ease the burden of, of this uh, use of fire. Um, and, and here we looked at uh, sort of anticipated levels of fire support. Um, with an aim of supporting data exchange from a number of systems that have uh, varying levels of fire compatibility. Uh, so the, the sort of three categories that, uh, that have been identified are uh, systems that may be fire naive, where there is no sort of fire support, um, there, there's not necessarily an API or a, a REST API, um, but there is some level of, of backend access to either a database or a way to, to export data from that system. 
Uh, we then move on to the fire aware system, which may have some API, but not necessarily a full, fully fledged fire API. Um, so here there could be some endpoints, some custom endpoints that are added to the system that would be fire compliant, but it's not necessarily a, a fully fledged um, you know, fire API. And then finally, we have the, the fire native system that uh, has that full fire stack, um, a, a data model based on fire and sort of supporting tools that, that can uh, uh, both process, uh, send, and receive um, fire-based data. So the, the ideal is, is uh, naturally the, the fire native system, um, but what we wanted to do was look at how could we support uh, particularly the, the fire aware um, approach where there is uh, some level of, of development that's, that's possible um, using an API, um, but uh, limiting that to uh, sort of a few key endpoints that would be fire compatible. Um, and with that, we, we focused on the fire structured data capture, which I'll step into just now. So the, the sort of starting point and, and the foundation of this was the development of this uh, fire implementation guide. Um, the implementation guides are, are used to describe how fire is used in a particular context um, through a, a layered approach. So the, at the base, we have the, the, the uh, standard HL7 fire core specification. Um, we can then adapt that using implementation guides to suit our needs for a specific application solution or a particular domain or uh, jurisdiction-based um, implementation. So here we may have something like the uh, structured data capture um, implementation guide that uses this particular approach to fire. Um, on top of that, we may then uh, have a, a case reporting specific implementation guide um, that, that's really focused on the case reporting use case. Uh, from there, we could, we could adapt that to have a COVID-19 case reporting implementation guide. Um, and when that's implemented in country, uh, there may be something like a national implementation guide, um, which then customizes that existing um, implementation guide based on that particular jurisdiction and the, the country specific um, set of rules that are applied there. So this is where those, those implementation guides really become um, sort of key adaptable and reusable tools um, that, that make it easy easier for these uh, uh, fire-based data exchange systems to, to be adopted. So the, the structured data capture is, is uh, something that we looked at as well to support that um, fire, uh, fire aware type approach. Uh, we, we use it here to provide a, a simpler way for your point of service systems to offer some limited support for fire data exchange where there, there isn't a need for a fully fledged fire API. Um, there is uh, a need for uh, supporting population submission of a few key FHIR resources, um, namely the, the questionnaire and questionnaire response resources. Uh, so with, with this approach, it's, it's really useful for um, the sort of areas where questionnaires or forms are a standard way for collecting data. Uh, and it essentially uses a, a sort of a, a, a key value pair um, using a set of observations um, within that questionnaire. Um, and in questionnaire response resource, um, providing a, a simpler way to enable some level of, of fire support. Um, and, and then those questionnaires and questionnaire responses can then be uh, sort of unbundled or extracted um, into the corresponding fire resources before saving it to a, a fire server, for example. So with, with this, with the use of the fire implementation guide and with the adoption of, of that uh, structured data capture approach, what we're really trying to do is, is uh, go through a process of fire profiling um, and go move from the uh, WHO sort of uh, COVID-19 case report to something like a digital uh, you know, web-based uh, fire implementation guide that, that's published online. There are a key set of steps involved in moving from the form to the fire implementation guide. And, and we found that going through this process uh, once has made it easier to, to sort of adopt that same process going forward. Uh, the, the key steps involved in that are identifying your data and any constraints on that data, um, defining your logical models, defining your, your questionnaire as part of that structured data capture approach, uh, mapping to fire resources and adding examples. And with this process, what we, what we end up with is that fire implementation guide. So the, the key thing though is, is before that implementation guide is, is developed or as part of the development of that is this uh, defining your logical models, 
and and this is really a, a process of uh, data mapping um, and and you know identifying your your source data, um, identifying how that would be represented within a, a questionnaire or a questionnaire response. And then uh, uh, mapping that to your actual um, happy fire, your individual resources, as well as uh, terminologies or, or value sets um, that may be useful for that. So this, this process um, is, is definitely something that we found to be uh, really useful in, in the application in a number of other projects. Uh, but for the, the COVID-19 uh, data exchange project, this is the, the process that we adopted um, and, and found it to, to work quite well. Some of the other tools that we used uh, in, in this process um, was uh, Fire Shorthand and Sushi. Uh, and, and these are essentially a set of tools that allow us to more easily create uh, and publish your implementation guides. So the, the Fire Shorthand is a, a specially designed language for defining the content of those Fire implementation guides. Um, it's a simple and compact uh, markup format. Um, with, with tools to produce fire profiles, to add extensions, and then to publish those, those implementation guides. Um, and then your Sushi itself is a set of tools that supports the, the use of fire shorthand to create and publish those online fire implementation guides. So the, the, the end result is uh, uh, using Sushi, we're able to take what we've uh, built and, and uh, mapped in, in that uh, fire JSON um, shorthand and actually then sort of publish that as a an online, um, you know, publicly accessible implementation guide. So these are the some of the, the, the tools that we've used and, and some of the approach that we used uh, in, in this particular project. Um, what we ended up with was a, a, a COVID-19 case reporting and lab results uh, implementation guide, um, which we were then able to uh, integrate into Happy Fire uh, to uh, essentially provide a uh, an approach to this is how we're going to use um, uh, HR7 Fire in this particular project. Um, and that allowed us to use our mediators to then uh, persist data to Happy Fire um, in a format that could be adopted and adapted um, by others who, who would be able to, to reuse um, the, the, the code and, and the tools developed in this project. So I'll pause there and, and then, yeah, sort of uh, we, we do have uh, some additional content in terms of just um, outlining and, and describing some of the, the challenges, the opportunities, and some of the lessons that we learned uh, through the course of this, of this project and with our experiences in FIRE. Um, so I'll, I'll hand back to Jose at this point. Thanks. Thank you, Daniel. Um... Yeah, indeed, there has been some, uh, some, uh, so thanks, first of all, thanks for the good, uh, good presentation, good, uh, good explanation. I was really happy to see some of the, uh, some of the things that you mentioned there, because they are uh, perfectly in line of, with what we have been uh, discussing in our, in our previous sessions. So the, the, the process and the methodology that you follow for those things. Um, and it would be nice if uh, now in the next, in the next, um, next few minutes, if we could have a bit more of, of, of discussion on that. So how, what kind of, of method did you follow? So what, what was your approach to, to these things and how do we have the, um, yeah, how did you guys make to, to, uh, to put it all, all in, uh, yeah, all, all together with, with one practical goal, which is this COVID reporting that you have made. So maybe I could, um, I don't know if you want to, to continue with the slides or if we can have some more lively debate uh, on, on, on this and because yeah, I know you have the materials prepared. Yeah, absolutely. I'll uh, sort of show some of the, the content from the slides, but I, I think if we can yeah, open it up to, to discussion, um, that this is just some sort of high-level points um, of, of some of the, the, the sort of outcomes and findings that we think may be useful to, to others. Yeah, so that would be good. And then with, with this, I think we can we can start welcoming the uh, the the group, the, the participants that have questions, and they they can just jump in. As I will jump in with a few questions, others please uh, fill in. Feel free to to just come up with uh, with uh, more questions. But maybe uh, Daniel just also to, to bring up the the other colleagues. Um, um, Matt Matthew Dickey, uh, would it be would it would you be uh, able to share with us? the things that you found so the, the the process that you follow the approach that you follow and, and as as you made this what what did you have to think about or how 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 what 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 made you how did you make how how did you structure the um, 
this this flow of, of having from requirements until a delivered solution. Matt, if I can call up uh, call you up or call on you. We were doing the the COVID nineteen data exchange. We were doing it bit by bit. So we took um, sets of fields at a time. So the most important base um, information for a case report, for example, and we. We'd start by mapping that into uh, the uh, into the fish files, but we did it. We definitely split it, uh, starting with your base requirements, the base information you need, you need, and get those resources sorted. And doing it in that way gets your gets your project well structured, so you're not bogged down with dealing with weird extensions and stuff like that. You first have to get your base in. And yeah, and it's also, I think, dealing with the more, the easier fields like, I don't know, uh, date, birth dates and uh, names and IDs. You don't need to think about anything uh, too complex in fire. You look at your, your patient structure or you look at, um, we were using, geez, I can't remember the, the fire resource name now, uh, but we were using fairly simple things with, uh, I want to say also um, fairly mature resources. And then only as you start to deal with the more complex fields, do you need to start uh, referencing the more complex fire resources that aren't as well tested. Um, so break it up into chunks and deal with the mature stuff first and deal with the less, less mature resources and um, mappings later. Great. Yeah, uh, just, can I just can ask one more question, Matt? Sure. I'll just uh, if you if you so I, I like the split that you made the, the so the the, the the basic stuff, and then the more I don't know if, what what were used but more advanced or esoteric stuff. Uh, how would you split those in terms of how much was basic and how much was more funny to 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 look at, and uh, yeah, was it eighty twenty in terms of effort and in terms of amount? How how do you see that? So how What's your experience there? So this was this project was, I think, the first big uh, chunk of fire mapping um, uh, in implementation guide uh, profiling that we've, we've well I've done, and so we started with fairly simple stuff, and the majority was yeah fairly fairly simple mappings, and then moving on to the more complex uh, complex resources. But then sometimes you realize and you go back and you think this complex resource actually maps uh, possibly fields better than, than how you mapped it in the, in the more basic ones or vice versa. You thought this is actually a complex uh, data type, but it could be expressed uh, far easier in an observation than if you use this nuanced and uh, un immature uh, fire resource. And also as you're going through this, you are reading more and more about uh, the use cases of different resources and adding value to those resources uh, becomes uh, you build on value into the existing resources so one thing that um, I, I personally have overlooked in the observations in the observation resource was uh, I think the category of the observation and adding a link code there but then so we, we, we added link codes to those categories and everything seemed fine. But then as you're mapping these things, you also realize I am, I, me as a human trying to read however many loink codes that we've, that we've got listed is not a great thing to try and understand. You don't read a loink code and know, oh, that's, that's the blood pressure loink code. So with experience, it's like when you're using codes, always make sure you add a display or a description along with them to make, um, the mapping easier. Um, as for the computer, your happy fire instance can read that perfectly well, but for the implementer to understand the context of their mapping, adding in descriptions and display uh, stuff, or even just comments, if possible, in the code to say, this is, this is the field you've mapped and why you've mapped it. I think that's a, a big part of implementing a, a, well, an implementation guide. 
that's that's a good a uh, good thing. I think it'll be a common thing. Taking that and 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 expecting that not only that happened or not we not only found found that out. Uh, going back to to Daniel, um, you have what what other challenges? What other things did you figure out or did you find out during the execution of this? As we implemented not only this specific scope but also fire. So what things did you uh, find and how did you yeah how did you get over it? Yeah, thanks. I, I think uh, one of the things um, I'll, I'll touch on two things. The first was there was a an easier part of this was definitely we, we looked at the the case report and then also lab results. With the case report, we had a WHO uh, case report form that was the basis of. The, the source data, um, clearly defined, uh, very well defined, uh, sort of mature enough to quite easily map to um, a, a set of fire resources. Um, you know, it's, it's already there. Um, for for the lab results, the lab results we, we didn't necessarily have that that single standard or that single uh, piece of source data. Um, so what we actually did there was was look at. Uh, a range of um, sample source data, so other implementation guides um, that, that had already been developed around uh, COVID-19 uh, lab results, um, other uh, sort of country level um, uh, uh, forms and, and the fields that they used. Uh, and, and we sort of approximated a base standard to say, you know, this may not be 100% perfect, but as a baseline, this is these are the sort of common sets of fields um, and, and the most useful um, types of data that we want to collect. Uh, and, and then we then map that to, to fire. So with the, with the lab results one, it, it definitely took a bit longer and there were some, uh, I think uh, there, were, there were more decisions to make uh, with that. Uh, sometimes there's not necessarily a perfect uh, mapping to a fire resource. Sometimes there may be two or three that could be appropriate and, and sort of having to choose. Um, and, and I think some of this is, is uh, experience is, you know, you get more familiar with being able to identify and say, okay, this is probably best, um, or, you know, I know I've seen this uh, being used and, and we could probably map it, that's probably more appropriate. Um, but it's, it's also a case where, where sometimes there is that, uh, you know, uh, getting advice from others. Um, and, and this is where things like the uh, uh, Zulip uh, channels and, and uh, the sort of forums um, become useful to, to look, uh, you know, ask the experts basically um, when, when in doubt. Uh, so I think it's also a, a shout out to, to the FIRE community in terms of, of looking for support um, as you're going through this process. Um, and then I think the other one was, was also just with the, the structured data capture um, was new to us in terms of, it was the, the first time that we were actually, you know, putting this into practice. Um, and I think initially it, it sort of seems a bit overbearing and, and you know, you sort of uh, conceptually this, this seems complex, but as, as you sort of uh, unpackage it and, and find tools that can be used, and it, it was definitely something that, that sort of solved itself um, as we got more experience with it. So I think again, it's it's you know there's the the, the baseline of, of fire, but there are all these different uh, approaches and, and tools and technologies that are um, being developed and, and available to the community um, that, that are worth uh, spending some time on um, because it could make things a lot easier for you um, when you're looking at implementing fire. Thanks. So overall, when you have these these challenges. Um, is it the, um, so I, I, I'm happy that you mentioned the community. Uh, is this something that that uh, you see that, so both the implementations and the community and, and desk, time read, uh, desk time reading, those are things that both, all, all of them contributed to you to um, to overcome those, those challenges, right? Yeah, I, I think as well as, uh, I, I think one of the, the great things for us was, was being able to um, attend the HS7 fire dev days um, it was uh, remote uh, last year, uh, so it went virtual, um, which just uh, you know was was a lot easier for us to, to attend it, um, being in South Africa, you know, without any travel uh, costs, etc. Um, and and that was definitely, I think, uh, a quick uh, and easy way for us to, to upskill um, on on some of these uh, concepts and some of these tools. So I think we also learned a lot um, from that, uh, and yeah, would definitely recommend um, the, the the value of of that event. Okay, um, and I see Ryan has his hand raised. So Ryan, uh, just jump in. Please. Yeah, just I just wanted to add to that as well. I think one of the um, the big challenges is creating fire fire profiles is pretty uh, quite complex. Like uh, it is quite a challenging 
um, task, um, at least originally. And now we have the, the like invents of some of these tools that can help you like fire shorthand and sushi. And to us, we always wanted to do fire profiling, but it was almost like un unobtainable before these tools were in place. So I think um, overcoming some of the challenges, we always knew we wanted to do this sort of profiling and this was the right way. It was just really tricky to do without the right set of tools. So now that we, during the, the fire dev days, we learned about um, uh, fire shorthand, we learned about sushi, we started playing around with it ourselves and found out that getting into the fire profiling um, uh, process was a lot simpler than it once was. And that allowed us to actually get started and, and go down this, this route. And it definitely feels like this is the way we should be doing it going forward. It's much more, you know, much more structured, much more, we, we have like it's a good process in place that we can now follow for future projects that we didn't really, that we wanted to obtain before, but weren't able to. So yeah, I think that's a sort of a key part is the, the tools that have been up and coming. Right. Thank you. That's that's actually very very useful. Um, from the uh, from the sushi, from the fire community, I can also mention that that's exactly the kind of feedback that makes us have better and better tools. Because if we if indeed we realize that well, profiling is very important, but doing it right is difficult, or even starting to do it, it's a bit it's a daunting task. And and if we have the right tools to start with it quickly, uh, so we're looking forward for more of that feedback for us to continue improving our tools and for you as well to help us improve the tools, whatever those are. Um, so thanks, thanks for that. Um, and looking at how do we, how, yeah, how, how the tools facilitate that or facilitate the work. One part of the work is the profiling. So we need to do that. Um, and how do we have then the, the other part of it, which is after you have the implementation guide, how do you, de how do you deploy it? So maybe um, I would just like to, to, to ask, I don't know, Daniel again, how do you deploy this in your project in your country? How did you go at it? Thanks. I, I think that's that's definitely still a, a work in progress in terms of, of uh, you know finding um, the the application of this uh, within countries. So that there is some uh, ongoing work in terms of of uh, actually applying and, and using uh, not only this implementation guide but but uh, others and other projects that we've developed. Um, and and this is where we're sort of finding a a best practice or a set of processes that make sense. So going back to that uh, uh, implementation guide sort of customization um, in, in terms of, uh, you know, adapting a base level implementation guide for a country use. So, you know, we, we've uh, uh, mapped to a set of uh, LOINC, which is a, you know, one of many uh, 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 sort of uh, data exchange and terminology standards, but there are many more. Uh, some countries may have uh, their own custom ones. They may, you know, ad adopt uh, other international ones, SNOMED, ICD, et cetera. Um, so there, there definitely is a need to adapt uh, these implementation guides um, for deployment in a particular jurisdiction or, uh, you know, for particular applications that are making use of this. Um, and, and that's where we're sort of trying to, to still, I think, develop the, the best practice in terms of um, uh, where, where, does, where does that uh, customization of the implementation guide sit? Um, is it a, uh, does it sit uh, within the existing implementation guide? Is it a sort of copy paste, uh, you know, uh, customize and, and publish it as a separate implementation guide? Um, how do you link back to that, that source, uh, the, the original implementation guide? Um, these are the, the things that we're sort of trying to, to see how best to, to deploy these. Um, I, I think the, in, in a practical sense with, with uh, things like Happy Fire um, allow you to uh, essentially um, pull in an implementation guide and say, you know, this is, this is what my uh, data should look like uh, when it's coming in. So in, in that regards, the deployment of these implementation guides can be used as actual practical tools um, in, in the deployment of, of these solutions. Um, and, and that's particularly useful. But in terms of uh, sort of customizing them and, and figuring out um, how best to, to deploy for particular use cases, uh, it, it's definitely something uh, that, that, that's ongoing in terms of, of us uh, trying to identify our, our best practice for that. Thanks. Thank you. Sorry, I was on mute. Um, thank you, Daniel. Um, 
Yeah, I, I, and I agree. It's it's kind of a it's we are the, the entire community is working on this and looking at our our participants in the session today. Uh, I think that many of our 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 the people that are attending this, they will be following a similar path. Hopefully, not as as rocky as we have found uh, together in our approach. So hopefully, the the path is going to be smoother and smoother for everyone. Uh, but yeah, it, it's great to have this this feedback feedback to see where where are things that we really know that helped us and the things where we still need or the community still needs to provide some more things like these tools that you just mentioned with the server. Um, speaking of which, and speaking of one thing that is actually um, a challenging, uh, and I can say this for me, uh, I'm, I'm living in and working in a country where we have three official languages. Um, and the fourth language is English, which is the language that I work in. Um, so and that's in within within one country but how as you go through this and have as you have to redeploy things yeah there will be things like we need to have new value sets new yeah like new jurisdictions and all these things how do you yeah how do you do that and how do you um, handle that or how, what are your plans what are your needs there so i would just sorry uh, ryan uh, if you want to chime in on that yeah thanks thanks Jose. so uh, different languages is not really something we've had to deal with. So we don't have too much um, advice there. So if anyone, <laughs> maybe even yourself, ha has anything to, to add there, um, that'd be useful for us. It'd be, uh, we'd like to hear, hear about it. Um, but in terms of general customization, we do, we have a sort of plan. Um, it sort of relates to what Daniel was saying. Um, because implementation guys can be Sort of structured in a hierarchy, so you can start with something, start uh, start with the core fire specifications, and as Daniel showed on a previous slide, start to restrict it down to something that supports your needs. We anticipate that that's how um, customization might be done. So for particular countries uh, doing customizations, they might take a base um, implementation guide and then create a new implementation guide out of it that just customizes. Customizes it slightly in some way to um, to add their own extensions or add their own value sets or um, replace value sets or extend value sets to add particular values or whatever else they might need to to do. So so that's our plan. We haven't really uh, delved into this uh, very much uh, at this stage. Um, and, and sort of related is also we're hoping that as this process of creating implementation guides becomes more common um, uh, in other parts of the world, other than like the US, which has a really good like set of core profiles. Maybe we'll start to see very popular implementation guides pop up that many countries um, could start to reuse um, and base their, um, their implementation guides off of. Exa example, um, like Daniel mentioned, there could be one for case reporting in general that might be quite useful for HIV, for COVID, for uh, a variety of other um, case reporting needs that at least gives you a general structure to work with them. Um, and then your customization task is a lot smaller than constricting the, sorry, restricting the, the core definite, the core specifications. So, I mean, that's about as far as we've got thinking about customization. Right. So uh, taking that, so indeed there is a plan now for having also this layered approach to, to see if we can have some some uh, some case reporting found, uh, foundation uh, implementation guide or artifacts or set of artifacts, whatever that that maybe avoid much of the of the profiling work or the technical profiling or maybe that enables the deployment, etc. Um, and then we have then indeed it can be country specific customizations, it can be topic specific customization that you see something that's generic. Uh, I don't know if it can be very generic, but something that's made, for example, for uh, for COVID and you say, okay, this is the part that I have to peel off and put the, the, the other stuff for malaria or for Zika reporting, something like this. Uh, there are plans to, to, to address that, but indeed that would be a good. And Ryan, sorry for throwing you the uh, trick question on the multiple language, but that's something that I know is not ready. It's something that uh, I expect it will be, you know, the community will be will be working on this somehow, and we are interested parties. So not only the people that work with uh, with international domains, we are all interested parties. So the people that are working on a, on a local domain, most likely they can get away with having this in one language, 
but the people that have the uh, that have to, to provide these foundations are the people that have multiple language multiple languages in, in one country they'll have to, to handle this so it does not to, to answer what exactly are you doing there maybe you don't even have a plan but just to, to mention that um, it, it's good to keep these these things uh, these problems visible uh, one more thing that I would ask still in the, in the in the realm of tooling and how do we do this so uh, Daniel you mentioned the the happy server but I know that one of the components of of of, of especially questionnaires is not only the data storage is also the data um, capture so the the questionnaire itself um, how do you have the uh, so how, what did you use in terms of taking the questionnaire resource and displaying it so you have different different solutions many different solutions how did you um, what did you choose uh, for what, what did you choose for you for your implementation or how, how do you handle that or the variety of tools or did you stick to one how do you handle that thanks yeah so we we, we looked at a, a few different tools um there I, I think again this is where the the fire uh, community and you know community at large uh, there are a number of tools that have been developed for like displaying and rendering questionnaires so um, some of these you know can be used as, as generic tools or sort of uh, plugged into your existing um, uh, applications uh, we definitely looked at a few and, and looked at the need for for some so things like you know that there's a, a questionnaire app there's a form builder um, there are also other tools that that provide for uh, implementation of things like skip logic and, and some of the more sort of complex uh, questionnaire and, and form type uh, approaches um, I, we, we didn't necessarily settle on one um, the, the intention of this is, is to sort of be uh, leveraged by a number of, of point of service systems um, so we didn't uh, within the scope of this it, it wasn't necessarily to, to design a, uh, a form display or, or uh, to, to actually you know render those those questionnaires um, but uh, working with um, communities and, and systems and tools like uh, OpenMRS for example um, we've had a sort of investigation into you know how could this be uh, some of these tools be used um, within something like an OpenMRS form, for example, um, to, to actually provide a, a standard way of, of uh, not only uh, structuring that questionnaire, but also rendering it and displaying it. So we, we definitely think that there is, uh, with some of these tools that are available, um, that they're worth looking into. And, and uh, for those building some of these point of service systems, um, you know, there's not necessarily a need to, to reinvent the wheel each time. Uh, where some of these could potentially be, be plugged in or incorporated into into existing uh, uh, sort of form builders um, to, to provide a way to, to have that that questionnaire compatibility um, out the box so again uh, definitely worth investigation um, in, into what's available and what's out there uh, to, to make make your lives easier thanks right right thank you um uh, first uh, uh, so i have a small uh, follow-up question on that but first to invite the, the participants. So um, anyone, please, uh, it would be interesting to see what are your concerns or questions are. It can be a specific question or, or a generic concern or something that you see that you didn't see in this presentation and you'd like to address or something that you want to leave open for, for discussion. I would invite anyone to just start putting the questions on the chat or just speak up, uh, feel free to do that. Uh, meanwhile, um, on the tooling, uh, Daniel, just a short question. Do you think then that tool discovery is a, has been an important part of your work and it, it's something that is important for people to know where to find the right tools or is it's it's there and you have two of them and they're already available how do you feel that how do you experience that um i, I think there's definitely it, it's not necessarily one tool for each uh you know each of these components i think there's there's usually a number of uh, tools available um i think it's about finding the the most appropriate tool for your needs um, and, and in some cases, you know, there isn't a tool that, that's uh, suitable. Um, I, I think a lot of these things are sort of in active development, um, just as the fire standard is, is, you know, and the specification is, is, being, uh, is being matured. I think a lot of these tools are also being matured. So in some cases, you know, some of the tools are, uh, for example, Windows specific, um, which can be a problem for uh, an organization like us that's, that's very uh, uh, sort of Linux focused. Um, sometimes they, those aren't always the, the easiest tools for us to use. Um, but in, in other cases, there, there are um, you know, tools that are, again, appropriate uh, open source and, and can you know, be, be leveraged as a sort of framework. Um, I, I think uh, there's 
not necessarily one place to go to find all these tools. Um, there's definitely a process of discovery that's that's required. Um, sometimes, you know, there, there are uh, sort of wiki pages with these things listed out and, you know, comparisons, tool comparisons, etc. Um, things like the, the dev days, we also, you know, I think found, uh, discovered a, a whole bunch of tools that we had never sort of seen or heard of before. Um, but I think with with a bit of googling um, and and you know finding the the right sort of uh, resources, uh, it, it makes that discovery a, a bit easier. Um, but yes, there, there isn't necessarily you know one go to point um, to to find exactly what you need. Uh, that there is a bit of discovery in, in in that. Thank you. So, do we have any specific or generic questions from anyone in the uh, in the part in the other participants? Is anyone and that we ask questions to the to the to the participants? Is anyone going through this path now? Is anyone starting to implement something like this, like a case reporting solution, or is anyone interested in in, in implementing this uh, somehow sometime soon? Is this specific topic of case reporting of interest to the uh, to the to anyone in the in the audience in the participants now? If I I don't hear anyone, so I do not know how to presume that these people are shy to, to say that we need that or or this is a topic that doesn't relate to them. Um, if we don't have questions, I have a couple of more of, of, of ideas because this is something that we have. Oh, thank you. Charlie, question is, have you been used to have you been able to use the developed standards practically and widely? Uh, Charlie, you sent the question to me, not to the rest of the group. So I don't, if you don't mind, I'm reading it out loud. So how have you been able, have you been able to use developed standards practically and widely? If yes, how have you gone about that? Um, Charlie, I presume that the developed standards, those are those, do you mean the, the fire standard or the COVID report standard implementation guide that they made? I, I, I don't, I'm not sure which one you mean here, the fire one, yeah. So have you been able to, to, to use the, 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 the fire standard practically and practically and widely? And how have you gone about that? So any comments from, from you guys, from Jebby on, on how that on how you have been able to um, to adopt in practice fire? Any details? Sure, I can I can take that maybe. Um, yes, we have. Um, in a number of projects we've been using fire. Um, for quite a few um, years now. And it seems like um, even though we deal with many different countries, South Africa included and other um, African countries, it's always generally applicable. Um, I think FIRE aims to, I think the general rule of thumb with FIRE has that it's been that it tries to support 80% of what everyone needs. And then the final 20% is left sort of up to um, uh, extensions or whatever you need to that's more implementation specific so we found that generally that's worked pretty well for us um, you always sort of need to you come across something during an, an implementation or a project that's not covered or that there's not a mature um, fire resource for um, and then you might have to do some some work and extensions or um, define something custom um, and that's, yeah, that's just sort of part of the, the standards process. But at least some of the mature resources like a patient's like observations, encounters, um, all the, the basics are generally always the same. And that's a lot of the, the data that you're sharing relies on those sorts of um, pieces of information. So we found it to be largely applicable in those cases. Um, and the one thing that we're learning now is that uh, actually defining your extensions and all of these other things that we'd normally do the last 20% in a profile is very useful <laughs> because then we have a very structured way of re representing that, that we know like these are the things we need to, to add. These are the changes we made. And it's very easy to communicate with other partners to say, these are the extra things you need to do to support our use case. So that's been a, Sort of a new revelation for us that I think has been quite important. 
And just to plug in the community spirit here, uh, that's also good feedback for the rest of the FIRE community. So FIRE community is looking actively at what the implementers are doing. So if there's an extension, if people are using extensions, if many, many people are using this extension or that extension, this means that maybe this should be part of the, of, the, of the FIRE standard itself. So it's always important to get feedback from the implementers. So as, as you guys have done and as the, the other participants, they will, they will surely do, it's, it's very good to, keep, you know, to keep, keep in contact with the rest of the community to say, hey, we have used this extension. Oh, wait, we have used that extension as well, or we have used something else. So it will be good to keep, to keep those things fed back to the community. I have another question from Michael. Um, are there any contexts or settings where you would recommend against using Fire? Uh, this was indirectly answered somewhat, but I'd love your opinions. I have my opinion, but I would let others uh, also chime in on that. Sorry, I did not mean to disarm anything. My opinion is that, well, if if there's nothing else there, then you use Fire. If some, if you, if you have something that works and you just need to change some things, then maybe it's not good to use Fire. But if you don't have system that work, or if this is relatively independent from the, the systems that work, uh, why not using fire? The worst thing that you do is not standardizing, uh, but st using fire uh, compete just, just to, to have another standard that's, that's also not necessary. So there, there's a balance there. I don't know if you have those, those, uh, those experiences as well, that experience as well. I've got a, an opinion here on this. Um, so a case where I wouldn't recommend using fire is say when uh, the the place that's going to be maintaining this, like so sure you as the the implementer put it in, but the people who are maintaining it, like I don't know, they they might be a stressed admin who's maintaining twenty other projects um, wherever they are, and you're going to add far more complexity by I don't know pushing fire on them when there is already yeah an existing system. So that's a context where I would be a bit more hesitant about adding an, because there is an overhead to this. Adding in an IG, adding in fire is an overhead. Sure, in the long run, it's, it, it will be useful. But if you're a stressed, <laughs> a stressed admin, uh, I don't think you're going to get the buy-in. And you need to get um, the buy-in of the people who will be maintaining this. Um, so Jean-Pierre, you asked the sh share the links for the other resources. Um, I don't know exactly which resources you mean, but the this presentation will be available on our on our blog. Ah, oh, yeah, sorry, and Vanda is already pasting the, the documents there. Yeah, thank you, Vanda. Um, but you can always go to the uh, to the to our website when you have these these uh, the, the 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 key uh, links there. Um, I would ask one final question, looking at the time as well. Uh, looking at what you've done and what you see ahead of you, and what. And the status of maturity that you have, and the, the, the status, the feeling of maturity that you have, that you may have from the from the fire standard and all the the, the related tools and the, the entire ecosystem. Daniel, what advice? What advice do you want to give um, to the people that are going to do the same thing, or thinking of doing the same thing, or thinking of going a different path, but maybe they they want to to do those things the same way? Um, what advice do you want to give? Or do you have any advice, any recommendations, any do's or don'ts? Do you have any ideas to share? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think the the great thing about Fire um, is is definitely you know uh, maybe in comparison to other standards is is that there is always a learning curve when when adopting a standard. But uh, in the case of Fire, the the documentation, the community, um, or all, all the the tooling around it, uh, I think is 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 a lot easier to use. Um, there, there, there's, um, it, it's built to be practical. Um, and, and that's something that's, that's refreshing. Um, you know, that there is the, the computer readable versions of all these things, but there's also the human readable versions. A lot of the, the way that these implementation guides and the fire documentation is structured is to make it uh, that easier to, to, to learn. So, you know, the, the barrier to entry um, can seem overwhelming, but it, it really is, you know, once, once you sort of get into it, um, I, I think the other, the other sort of piece of advice is definitely try and find a uh, process that can be repeated. That, that's something that's been extremely valuable um, for us is now we sort of know this, these are the steps we follow. Um, and, and we can apply that to you know, many different projects. Sometimes there is variation or there's additional stuff needed, 
But uh, in, in general, um, you know, the, the first project took us uh, X amount of months. We've now been able to reduce that to, you know, X divided by four number of months um, for, for future projects. Um, and then I think the final piece of advice is, is uh, um, you know, use the community. Um, there, there are, you know, a whole bunch of very expert people um, and, and organizations and companies that are working in the fire domain um, that have looked at these problems, that have solved some of these problems, um, and there isn't necessarily a, a need to sort of reinvent the wheel or to, to struggle as much as you think you, you should um, when faced with a challenge. So, yeah, make use of, of uh, uh, you know, uh, learning facilities, uh, documentation, um, existing tools, etc. cetera, uh, has, has definitely been a, a great thing for us. Thanks. Okay, we have one more question and I was typing an answer to this, but I will just say it. Um, so the question is, uh, what are the next steps after having an implementation guide? So uh, Nello, this is a very important or very common question and very interesting. Um, so uh, two things, you may follow it up on the usual place and the usual place is chat.fire.org where many people are looking at the same things. I am personally looking at that as well. Um, and you can also join us in our, so we have in a few weeks from now, we have a, um, just some, some open discussion sessions uh, like, a, like we just, we just uh, meet for one hour and discuss random topics. It might be interesting to bring that up because that's also something that I'm, I'm personally interested in, in chasing. Um, but feel free to, to, um, to have that discussion on chat.fire.org. If you don't have an account yet, please do that. Yeah, so, and please, please do that and, and, uh, and just bring up the question because we'll have more technical input there. So in, in, in our fire chat, fireside chats, we'll have the uh, you know, a discussion and we'll point to the current state. But then if you want to follow up on the topic and you ask many people, then you this is an interesting topic that we will have in the in the in the fire chat. But it's definitely something that's in our in our short term horizon. Thanks, Brenda, for the direct link. And uh, yeah, with this, yeah, I think we are good on time. Uh, Brenda, I would I, I think we are done. Uh, I don't know if you want to wrap up. Yeah, I just want to say thank you very much to Daniel, Ryan, and Matthew for joining us and giving us a walkthrough about their experience of, of using mm -hmm. fire. Um, as we okay. just mentioned, we have a, a fireside chat coming up on September 17th. Um, the registration link is in the chat. I will send it along with the recording of this session along with the slides um, in a few days. And then we have a session on fire search coming up on October 6th, and I'll send that registration along um, in email as well. So thank you very much, everyone. It was a pleasure. Um, thank you again to Daniel, Ryan, and Matthew. We really enjoyed hearing from you guys. All right, goodbye. Thanks so much, all. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, thank you. Yes. Thanks, all. Bye.